As introduced, I'm Dr. Belinda Lee. I'm a medical oncologist. I work at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and at Northern Health. I'm also the Centenary Research Fellow at the Walter and Liza Hall, where I do my medical research, and I'll be talking today about the Purple Pancreatic Cancer Translational Registry. Just as a very brief background, as we all know, the pancreas is a gland within the digestive system. It's located in the upper part of the abdomen, just behind the stomach and in front of the spine. And it has two main roles. It helps to digest food by releasing pancreatic juices and enzymes. It also helps to regulate sugar levels by producing insulin. Now, there are several different types of pancreatic cancer, but 95% of most pancreatic cancers are pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. We often refer to this as PDAC in short. Other forms of pancreatic cancer include cystic tumours, neuroendocrine tumours and acinar um, cell carcinomas. Um, just to be clear, the majority of the work we're talking about today is related to the pancreatic ductal adenocarcinomas. So unfortunately, pancreatic cancer has one of the lowest survival rates of all cancers. The data on the left-hand side is taken from our purple translational registry based off the information from Australia. And based on what we currently have collated, we can see that there's over 2,000 patients in the pancreas cancer registry. What we're seeing here is that, unfortunately, the majority of patients are presenting with advanced or unresectable metastatic disease. So that's um, shown in the purple and the blue. If we look at the data in the middle, this is taken from the American SEA database. And this looks at outcomes from the years 2005 to 2015, and it's looked, showing you five-year survivals. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is that over the last 10 years, there has been no improvements in pancreatic cancer outcomes. And the data on the far right is taken from Europe. Oops, sorry. And again, what they're saying that it was worth still for in the UK, there's been no improvements in pancreatic cancer over the last 40 years. So we are now predicting that by the year 2030, pancreatic cancer is likely to become the second leading cause of cancer-related death globally and in Australia. So these statistics are very sobering and they really highlight the need as to why we need to do more research in this cancer to improve outcomes. This is taken from the Australian Department of Health and what this shows is the incidence of pancreatic cancer. So these are bar graphs showing the number of patients every year between 1982 to 2020. What we can see that between 1982 to 2000, there has been a slow increase in incidence of pancreatic cancer. But for some reason from 2002 onwards, there's actually been an acceleration with a 60% increase in the number of patients and diagnosed with pancreatic cancer over the last few years. Now, part of this reason, if we think for the incidence of the rising um, pancreatic cancer, could be attributed to the aging population, to population growth, and to pancreatic cancer in general becoming more commonly diagnosed across all age groups. In 2020, the Australian Department of Statistics released this following information, and they showed that in the year 2020, 3,933 patients were diagnosed um, the same year, up to 3,300 patients unfortunately passed away with pancreatic cancer. So yes, these are very sobering statistics. I think this leads me on to say why we formed the Purple Translational Registry. So this is a registry that I established in 2016. And really the aim of this registry is to be a multidisciplinary, prospective, comprehensive registry of data on all aspects of pancreatic cancer. So we collect data in all stages. We collect information about treatment outcome as well as genomic data. But really the goals of what we're trying to do is to improve data sharing and collaboration across laboratories and cancer centers. We want to be able to provide a very comprehensive information system that consolidates the data from clinics as well as from research into a unique platform. And this is a system that is both efficient and scalable. I mean, unfortunately for Australia, there is no one cancer centre that has enough cases for them to make a meaningful insight into pancreatic cancer. We can only do this and improve outcomes if we work together. And that's why we created this registry. So the registry allows us to consolidate data into one unique platform, and this is a number of very valuable insights and reasons why we have created it. I mean, data is currently held in many silos. So I work in a lot in clinical trials, and I know that as we enter data into each individual clinical trial, at the end of that trial, that data will be lost. And this is a bit of a bugbear because it takes a lot of time to collate data and then to know that at the end of the trial, you can't use that data anymore. 
But if we actually put it onto one system, we can then continue to use that data and build on that data. Um, and allowing us to have a data sharing platform helps us to reduce costs. And it's also more efficient to do it this way. So it has holistic benefits, not only for patients, but payers, providers, and researchers. The other thing about having a, this database is it allows us to find the right intervention for the patient at the right time. And this would help us to optimize our selection of patients for clinical trials. By integrating the genomic data and biomarker data that we create um, when we're doing our research, we can then create a more predictive prognostic um, information. And this helps us to really focus our research on what's most important. And I think also very importantly, when we have this volume of real world data, it allows us to be globally competitive. So we are finding you know, the right information and able to um, do the right type of research that we need to be doing. So you can see here that we now partner with 43 cancer centres across Australia, Singapore and New Zealand. And I think the ability to bring together this number of centres and this volume of information in such a short period of time really is a testament to the fact that the other centres are see the value in what we're trying to achieve here and what we're trying to do. So I'll talk a little bit more about the registry and what it can achieve and what it has been doing. So the Pancreas Purple Registry provides a very clear oversight of what's happening. And I think you know, it's very important if you want to be able to understand how to improve things, you've got to know where you are, where you're starting from. So in 2017, a year after we first established the registry, we were able to produce a report for the Pancreas Cancer Summit. And in this report, you can clearly see that we have very granular data. We understand you know, the stage at which patients are presenting. We understand what treatments they're going through, what drugs they're receiving, and what the outcomes for each patient by stage are. The Purple Registry also provides very in-depth analysis. So here, this is data that we presented at the 2018 Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre workshop. And what you're looking at is um, data about chemotherapy use, so there's four rings. The inner ring is about new adjuvant chemotherapy. That's chemotherapy given before surgery. The next ring is the adjuvant therapy. That's treatment given after surgery. And then we have first line palliative treatment and second line palliative treatment. And this lets us at a snapshot understand what's happening across Australia and what drugs are being used, where the variations in um, treatment patterns are occurring. And I think this is very valuable information. The Purple Registry is the only registry that tracks the entire patient journey. So this is a Sankey diagram. And what it shows us is we can understand, you know, at the point of presentation, what stage patients are at and then what happens. So every procedure that they have, we will collect this information. So we'll know if patients are stented, if patients are given chemotherapy, and then do they go on to surgery or not? And if they don't go on to surgery, do they have radiation or do they have um, chemotherapy given to them? And we presented this data at the COSA 2019 Annual Scientific Symposium and was selected for one of the um, best digital health presentations at the time. But I think all this information is we've got to use it to really um, create meaningful insights. You know, it's good to have the information, but what do we do with that information? So on the left hand side is a bar graph, and this is data um, taken from all the key clinical trials in pancreatic cancer. And it shows that with each increasing combination of chemotherapy, we are slowly improving outcomes. And so these are outcomes for advanced metastatic pancreatic cancer patients. We can see that the addition of um, abraxane to gemabraxane improves things to eight months, and that the use of fulfurinox provides at least a 10-month additional benefit. And the data in the middle and to the right, this is what we've taken from the Purple Translational Registry. So I think, you know, quite encouragingly, we're seeing that actually we have made some headway in treating this disease. We can now show you that, you know, patients who are getting up to second line treatment are doing better than they were in the trials. So, you know, the data on the far right, the curves were published last year in a paper we um, discussed the use of chemotherapy. So when patients don't receive any chemotherapy, then unfortunately the median of survival may be limited to 2.4 months. But if we're able to give them up to second line therapy, then we're achieving things up to 14.2 months. And this is an improvement in where we have been and an improvement in outcomes. Um, this is, I've put this slide in because, in fact, one of the patient advocates at Peter Mac asked me about this. They wanted to understand a little bit more about resections and outcomes. 
And so this is a project we're still working on. We haven't yet published, so I'll just talk, touch on it very briefly, but really to show you that we do have information about what's happening to patients. So we are particularly looking at the borderline risk extra board pancreatic cancer patients to understand um, who's getting surgery, who's not getting to surgery, what the impact of new adjuvant chemotherapy has been on these um, patients and their outcomes. So this is work that we're currently doing. But I think overall what I want to show you, and I hope you've seen just with the examples I've given, is that the Purple Registry is helping us to understand the landscape and why it's so important that we understand where we are so that we can then help to make improvements and understand where the problems are. Um, so we've shown again that, you know, this is the data we're collecting. This is where um, the clinical pathological information we have on this and also how we link this to outcome data. I'd like to move on now to talk about um, the registry as a platform for innovative research. So what I want to show you is that the registry isn't just about collating clinical data. That's just sort of the basic core function of what we do. But there's a lot more to what we're trying to achieve here. So what I spend a lot of my time in the laboratory doing is working on something called a multi-omic approach to biomarker discovery. So currently in pancreatic cancer, we don't have any um, useful biomarkers. Aside from CA99, which is used in clinic, there is no other biomarker that helps us understand which treatments to pick or which treatments may be helpful in the future for patients. What we're trying to do here is by using the database, which is a customized database with the clinical data, we're matching that up against um, biospecimens with consent from patients to collect these. And we've now got over 2,000 patients in the registry, and this is then linked with a virtual repository of over 480 resection specimens and over 600 um, biospecimens from consented patients. We're doing a lot of work around understanding the immune microenvironment, understanding the immune system itself, um, looking at blood biomarkers, um, and we do things called multiplex IHC, which looks at the tumour itself. We use the blood to understand what immune cells are in your system, and we also look at the blood to understand the proteins that are being produced into the bloodstream from the tumour, as well as linking it to the genomics. And I think this is really important because this is really the next step of trying to understand how do we link the interplay between the tumour and each individual patient and their immune system to be able to find the best treatments for them. Um, what I'm showing you here is that you know, with one patient, we're able to do multiple analysis, and that's really valuable because up until now, a lot of science is based off individual samples from one or two cases. But actually, if you can run multiple testing on the same case, you, there's a much greater, richer value in that and the data that you can produce from that. I'm going to talk very briefly about circulating tumor DNA. So I'm the co-chair for the Dynamic Pancreas Clinical Trial. Um, and the Purple Registry is really enabling us to provide a base for our clinically relevant cancer biomarker research. So for those who may not be familiar with the term circulating tumor DNA, circulating tumor DNA are minute amounts of um, fragments from the tumor that are released by the tumor as cells die and actually are secreted into the blood system. So obviously these uh, fragments of tumour should not be present in a healthy person's blood. Um, but we are able to use this now to do a lot of research. And the reason why circulating tumour DNA is such an exciting potential biomarker is that it is highly specific to the cancer. We look at the genetic changes on the tumour itself, and then we match them to what we find in the blood. So if we can find that genetic marker from the tumour in the bloodstream that shouldn't be there, then we know that circulating tumor DNA is present. We can also use the circulating DNA to understand the genetic changes that are happening and driving a particular tumor. I think but the beauty of circulating tumor DNA is that it has a very short half-life. Um, so this means that you know, it lasts for about three to four hours in your bloodstream. So that if we take a blood sample and it's present, it means that there is a tumor that is secreting this into the blood system because otherwise it shouldn't be there as opposed to um, CA99, which is a commonly used biomarker at the moment, which has a half-life of about two to three days. So it's not as dynamic as circulating tumor DNA is. 
And the other important thing about circulatory tumor DNA is obviously it's much easier for us to access. It's a simple blood draw as opposed to an invasive biopsy, which would otherwise need to be done. And we can use circulatory tumor DNA to monitor for the evolution and how the tumor is changing and to understand resistance to treatment with circulating tumor DNA. So, you know, circulating tumor DNA has a number of clinical applications. It can be used for early detection of cancer. It can be used to detect recurrence. It can be used to monitor treatment responses, and it can be used to monitor for evolution and resistance to treatment. Um, this is a schema showing how the purple translation registry is linking to clinical trials. And this is an important function for the registry. So in this particular study called the dynamic pancreas, it's for patients who have resected pancreatic cancer who are about to receive adjuvant chemotherapy. And the idea is that we would take a blood sample or known as a liquid biopsy to test the circulating tumor DNA, which after a curative intense surgery, we would, should not expect to find it there. Now, if we do find circulating tumor DNA, we would then recommend that chemotherapy treatment is escalated to try to get rid of the circulating tumor DNA. And if it's present, then there is a possibility to reduce chemotherapy in order to reduce toxicity to those patients. This is the schema um, for the study itself. So the study is now running at 28 cancer centers across Australia, and really our aim is to understand how we can utilize ctDNA to inform our adjuvant treatment. We're trying to answer questions around who we should be treating, how long we should be treating, and how many drugs are really needed in order to remove the circulating tumor DNA and reduce the risk of recurrence. If you would like to look up more information about this particular trial, it can be found on the AGITG website. That's the Australian GI Trials Group website. I'm going to touch very briefly on a very exciting project that we're working on with PanCare. So this is something that we've started developing this year, and it's looking at the idea of radiomics. So what is radiomics? Um, radiomics is the textual analysis and translation of medical imaging into quantitative data. What does that mean in lay terms? So what we're doing is we're using the routine CT scans that are performed for every patient and trying to use that data and understand every pixel has a grayscale on that picture. And if we can convert those pixels grayscales into numeric values, we can then create a signature for each patient. And we match that signature up against their treatment responses and outcomes. And ultimately, we want to create sort of algorithms and use machine learning to understand better what is happening to each patient based off a routine CT scan. And this has really significant implications because this is not invasive for patients and patients are already having these CT scans done routinely anyway. But if we can gain more information from your CT scan, which may help us to further understand what's the best treatment for you, this could have very big implications for the future. I mean, this is a project that is very cutting edge. This is new technology. And at the moment, you know, I don't think anyone in the world has really fully cracked this. Um, but we're working very hard to bring this and make this a capability that's possible for our patients. I think we already know that, you know, not every pancreas cancer is the same. We know that some pancreatic cancers are slightly more solid, some are slightly more cystic. So these are differences that we will, should be able to pick up on the CT and hopefully convert um, using radiomics. Um, we think that it's important because pancreatic cancer is a very heterogeneous disease, meaning that it's probably not one cancer, it's probably a multitude of variations of that particular cancer. And so if we can start to understand the different profiles, we will be better to able to understand what treatment options are best. So there are a number of issues in pancreatic cancer research, and here I just really highlight a few of them. I mean, particularly as an oncologist, as, you know, as well as a researcher, I'm very well aware that it is hard to move compelling science forward into clinical trials. And access to therapeutic remains very challenging for our pancreatic cancer patients. At the moment, less than 4% of pancreatic patients enter clinical trials. There's also a lack of data sharing. And this is part of the reason why we created the Purple Translational Registry to improve that collaboration between centers and between laboratories. We don't have any good 
predictive biomarkers at the moment. And again, that's why we do a lot of the laboratory work we're doing is focused very much on predictive biomarkers. So the current strategy is not working. And, you know, I strongly feel that we have to change our strategy if we want to move forward and make improvements in pancreatic cancer. I hope what I've shown you today through this very brief run through is that we are working on pancreatic cancer through the Purple Translation Registry on many fronts. You know, we're not just looking at one aspect of pancreas cancer, we're looking at all aspects of pancreas cancer. And what we're trying to do is create an ecosystem. So every study that we run through the Purple Translation Registry, you know, has a canon effect. It recapitulates upon itself each time the data we're getting becomes richer and more valuable with every study that we run. And we're trying to um, touch all areas of research. So not just clinical data, but really, you know, laboratory-based translational research. We want to help with the clinical trials. We're looking at real-world data. And we're also reaching out to familial cancer um, screening um, project as well. So we here we see that we provide the core clinical data for the research to occur. We are looking at investing in cutting edge technology with our work on radiomics and proteomics. You know, we are supporting early stage detection of pancreatic cancer with the ctDNA trials. And as I've mentioned this year, we have now linked our database with the National Familial Cancer Screening Project as well. So that will help to feed in more information about pancreatic cancer. And ultimately, what we want to achieve is to improve therapeutic outcomes. But this isn't going to be easy. This is going to take time. But we hope that we are building the correct infrastructure to make this possible. There's a lot of people I need to thank for this. You know, this is a lot of work done by many labs across Australia and Melbourne. Um, so thank you to all of you. Thank you to the patients who so kindly donated their time and consented to participate in our studies. And thank you to Pancare for all the support for the purple translation that they're providing. <laughs>